All right, we're here in uh, Romans chapter number 15. This is going to be part two of Romans chapter 15, preaching through this book verse by verse. Here we're going to go back in verse number 15. We read this prior. We're going to go uh, back a little bit into what we read last week to get the full context. Verse 15, the Bible reads, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God. So now he's going to explain to you why he wrote boldly. He says, because of the grace that is given to me of God, that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God. And then he says, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. So he's saying that he was selected specifically by God to bring the gospel of the Gentiles. And he's not, you know, just some Rambo that just chose, hey, this is going to be my decision and I'm going to go out and bring the gospel unto the Gentiles. He said, no, it was sanctified by the Holy Ghost that I should go forth. And he says, I can write unto you boldly because God is actually the one directly through the Holy Ghost that ordained me for the ministry of the Gentiles. Verse number 17, he says... I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. So he's saying, I could glory in the things that pertain to God, that God has worked through it. The fact that he brought the gospel basically to the entire world. And he says that in Colossians chapter number 1. Look at verse number 18. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ, Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So something that he has done... You know, something that he hasn't done through the Gentiles. Something, you know, that the Gentiles are growing in spiritually. Some blessing or some gift that they may have. Something that they have acquired over time in their spiritual growth. If he didn't take part of that, he's saying, I, wouldn't, I would not take credit for that if I was not responsible. And he says in verse 19, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and roundabout into Illyricum... I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. And he says, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So he's saying if there was somebody that had already reached an area, I'm not going to go to that area. If there, was, if there was a specific area that I know for a fact that everybody there has already preached the gospel, I'm not going to go there and just evangelize that area. Somebody could say, oh, well, Stephanie Jackson's is here. This this. You know, city has, you know, you know how many hundreds of thousands of people have not received the gospel yet? That's a stupid statement. If people have tried to say that there's already a, there's already a, a, a church in that city, that's retarded. They're not going to, if they are going to preach the gospel to every single person, it's going to be like 30 years. And you know how many people are going to die in 30 years that wouldn't get the gospel because we didn't come here? So that's a dumb statement. That's somebody, you know, people, people just want to, want to pick sides, and then they, they basically will just say whatever. They don't realize, like, how selfish and how stupid they are, you know, when they make statements like that. You should care about people. That's what you should care about. You should pay, our main, main priority should be about getting people the gospel. Amen. That's what our Amen. main priority overall should be. And even if we have, my point is this. Let me elaborate my point there. Even if we have some immature battle between two different churches... You should not let that affect other people's souls. So when somebody says some stupid statement like, oh, there's already some church there. Why are you going there? There's hundreds of thousands of people in the city. And by the time that, you know, they, let's say, preach the gospel, if they do to every single church, there's going to be a lot of people that didn't get the chance to hear the gospel. Right. So shut your mouth. That's super selfish. That's not, you don't care for souls. You're just wanting to be on this side and you'll say anything. That's, right. that's what it is. So you need to, we need to make sure we don't do that either. We just... We're just saying stuff just to be against somebody. Whatever comes to our mind. You know, you're just trying to make somebody look bad. You need to care primarily about the gospel and whether or not people are, you know, being saved. Whether or not people are being, are, are being evangelized or receiving the gospel. So you need to go. And here's the thing. If there's an area where you know that there's a church there and they're handling business and you don't need another church in that area, you don't go there. That's what he's saying. Or I didn't go and I didn't evangelize an area that's already been evangelized, right? He went to an area here that had not yet been evangelized, an entire area. And at that time, you think of the population, right? He could go into one city that has like 3,000 people, and he, he himself could convert a few people quickly. They could tag along. He could train them and show them how to go soul winning. And then they could literally knock all those doors in like, you know, however long. He, I, you don't know how long he's going soul winning, but maybe two weeks, three weeks, a month or something. Every single door. And you don't know how, what the population is. I'm just giving you an example. 
So he's not going to go to an area where literally they had knocked every single door. It's some, you know, uh, could be barbaric city that's kind of like out by itself. That's not a real high population. So it says in verse 21, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of. So notice, these are people that have never heard the gospel. To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been, in, I have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. So he's saying the reason that I haven't come to you is because somebody else already reached them. He, he goes on to explain here in a minute that nobody else, that nobody, you know, uh, he explains here in just a minute that somebody else is the one that was responsible and he's never met them. He actually says that he's never seen them face to face. So somebody else was the one that brought the gospel to them. And Paul being, an, a, you know, an apostle of high caliber, Paul being a man that even Peter says was very wise and knew a lot about the scriptures, it would be very beneficial for him to go there just to, you know, be with them as far as teach them, teach doctrine unto them. Get, you know, he talks about how he wants to go in the very beginning, I believe it's in Romans 1, how he wants to impart unto them some spiritual gift so he can teach them something as far as the scriptures. He can impart unto them some, and people say some spiritual gift, automatically people's minds go to like signs and wonders. When you look at 1 Corinthians 12, like we read just a couple of weeks ago, there's many things that are mentioned in there. Wisdom, uh, you know, tongues, which is not just... You know, the ability of miraculously speaking many tongues. Paul said, I thank God that I speak more tongues than ye all. When he was speaking to them about, uh, you know, the, the, the proper polity of to speak tongues and how to speak tongues. The reason why is because Paul traveled everywhere. Paul was like, you know, he, he was in all, every area of, you know, uh, that air of, uh, what is it called? It's Turkey now, but, you know, the Middle East portion of the area. He traveled up to Rome. He goes over to Spain. He's, obviously, he can't preach the gospel to some barbaric area that teaches some, you know, uh, that, or that speaks some language that not a lot of people speak unless he learns that language. So he's learning all these languages. He's, you know, imparting unto people spiritual gifts when he comes and visits them. And that's the reason why he's saying, I would like to come to you because I, wanna, I want to help you. I want to benefit you in your spiritual walk. So he says there in verse number, uh, verse number 24, we'll finish that verse. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward. By you, if it if first I be somewhat filled with your company, and then he says this. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. Now go over to Acts chapter number twenty-four. It's Acts chapter twenty-four, verse number seventeen. Acts chapter number twenty-four, verse number seventeen, is where you can see him mentioning, you know, um, that he's coming to Jerusalem now. He goes to Jerusalem a couple of times. He mentions that he goes to Jerusalem in Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter number 1 and 2. He talks about traveling to Jerusalem right after he got converted. And then he leaves for like three years, and then he goes back to Jerusalem again. And that's when he uh, you know, withstood Peter to the face. But uh, quite a while goes by, and he travels back to Jerusalem again. Now, I don't believe, and I look, and I can't remember any time where Paul actually ever ends up going and visiting Rome. But what he was doing, what's he, what he's explaining is that he's going to go down to Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is located more south. And then he's going to travel from Jerusalem and he's going to go up. And Rome is just north of Jerusalem. And it's somewhat, you know, if you will, northwest. And then if you're familiar with geography, Spain would be over here. So it would be reversed if you're looking at it. You know, Jerusalem would be here. Rome would be here. Spain would be here. So he's saying, once I leave Jerusalem, I'm going to go to Rome and visit you on my way to Spain, because Spain is way over on the west side. You know, so he's saying when I travel through there. So this is actually the last time before Paul is mentioned to have been, um, you know, uh, in bonds. Before Paul is actually taken and arrested. And this is actually when he's been taken and arrested. But this is the last time that he, he visited Jerusalem. So it's very possible that this was the time that he planned on going to Rome. And he ends up going to Rome, if you know the book of Acts very well, the story of Paul but not freely. He's taken to Rome in the Italy area because he's in bonds. And he appeals to Caesar, so then they take him there. But here in, in Acts chapter number 24, verse number 17, he says, Now after many years I came to bring alms to my nation 
and offering. So many years went by. So he hadn't visited Jerusalem for many years, he says there. And he says, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings, whereupon certain Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with multitude nor with tumult, who ought to have been here before thee and object if they had ought against me. So this was when he was arrested. You can read about that story previous there. But the book of Acts explains Paul's journeys all the way through chronolo in chronological order. And it's interesting to try to line up like the book of Rome where he's talking with the book of Rome when he writes to the church at Rome. The book of Rome when he's speaking to them and where, he's, where he is in you know, uh, the book of Acts. And I believe that it makes the most sense that that last time that he traveled to Jerusalem and he was arrested was actually after he left there was when he was going to go and visit Rome and then go to Spain. And like I said, he ended up going to Rome. And I'm sure, you know, it talks about other people when he was in Rome who came and visited him. Probably people from the church came and visited him while he was in prison. But he planned on going there freely, obviously, when he traveled to Spain. Go back to Romans chapter number 15. So we can see that that took place right before he was arrested. When he, when he had planned on, as I said, visiting Spain after he had visited uh, Jerusalem. It says in verse number 26, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Now what did he mention the reason why he was going to Jerusalem in Acts? Do you remember what we just read in Acts 24, 17? He said that he was coming to bring alms and offerings. And what does it say right here? He says right after that, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Now what is a contribution to someone that's poor in the Bible? What's it called? An alms, right? Or a contribution. So it perfectly lines up when you compare Scripture with Scripture. And, this is, and he says also when you compare that in Acts... And you look at that, he says that it's been many years since he's went there. The book, and when you look at the Pauline epistles, they are very much so in chronological order. Not exactly. It's almost like when you compare the Old Testament, because they're also put into subjects. But they're not exactly in chronological order, but they are very much so in chronological, chronological order. There might be a couple that are out of order. I've looked at it before. Uh, but it's almost perfectly chronological order. You can see in the beginning here when, in, in the, when the, he writes to the Romans, he's free, right? You start reading 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, you get down to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philippians and Colossians, he's in bonds already in Philippians. So you can see later on, Colossians, Hebrews, he mentions in the book of Hebrews that he's in bonds. The very last book that Paul wrote. So you can see this is chronological order, and here we see him saying that he went to take a contribution. And then in Acts 24, his last time visiting Rome, he makes the statement that he was there to give alms, right? And that's what he was doing here was to, to give a contribution to the poor. Look at verse number 27. It says, It hath pleased them verily, and, and their debtors they are, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made, made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 6. So what he's explaining there is, if the Gentiles benefited from those which are in Jerusalem in spiritual things, they taught them the Bible, they were able to be an example unto them, whatever it may be, they showed them how to do certain things, how to have charity, whatever it may be, whatever spiritual gift they imparted unto them. They taught them wisdom, of course, knowledge of the scriptures, they baptized them. They taught them how to go soul winning. They did all these things spiritually for them. And they're saying the least that you could do is minister unto them carnal things. I mean, if you think about that, what's more important? Spiritual things. Obviously, you know, you shouldn't be putting a price. If somebody's willing to show you something spiritually, they, you know, they shouldn't be expecting you to pay them for something. But if somebody is willing to just like friend to friend do something spiritually, it's not a big deal if you're like, hey, man, thanks a lot. You gave me five bucks or something. I'm not saying go around and just pay everybody for helping you. But my point is like an application here if somebody said, hey, why'd you do that? Why are they doing that? He's saying that if somebody is, you know, what's the big deal? He's obviously sticking up for this. What's the big deal if they went there and showed them how to do all these things and then later on they don't have money and they're broke? You know, help them out. If, if this is from a church to church basis is the point. If one church comes here and, does a, and would help us do a soul winning marathon... And down the road, we don't have money. And they're like, hey, you know, here's some money. That's what he's defending. There's nothing wrong with that. Because somebody could say, why are, they, why are they paying you money? 
He's like, they, you know, they help them in spiritual things. Is it a big deal if they, if they reap the carnal things from them, if they pay them later on when they've already been given spiritual things, which are more important in the first place? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 6. You can see this talked about again. We'll start reading in verse number 6. Yeah, it says, For I only and Barnabas, this is Paul speaking, have we not power to forbear working? He's saying, don't we have power to quit working? But we know that Paul was a tent maker. He continued, continued to work. He's saying, couldn't I stop working and just live off being an evangelist? Who goeth to warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock? and eateth not of the milk of the flock. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also. So the reason why he says, say I these things as a man, is because he's saying, I as an evangelist don't have the right to live as an evangelist. Don't I have the right, and he compares it unto going to warfare, right? So he's saying, those that would go, those that would go to fight, they would be given taxes, right? They would be given. Then he also gives another example of a person that would feed the flock, which is often an example of a pastor. And he, and he uses that example to say, those that would feed the flock, if I were to give you spiritual things, and somebody were to say, you know, do you, you know, you get paid from the church? If somebody gets paid from the church, you'll hear people complaining about that. The Bible teaches that a pastor, an evangelist, can be paid from the church. And that's exactly the statement that he's making in Romans. And he's making that statement like, is it a big deal if he gives you spiritual things and then he reaps from you carnal things? And people will complain about that. And they'll call people like that a hireling. You'd be calling Paul a hireling too because Paul's saying, now he goes on to explain that he, doesn't, he does not use his power in this passage, but he clearly explains that Peter and them do. You know, Judas had what? What did he have? The bag. What do you think they're getting that money from? What do you, you think that they're all just going out and building tents? They went around preaching the gospel constantly. That's all that Jesus was doing, traveling from state to state for, or from city to city to city, just going around and just preaching the gospel. People are giving them money. Why? Because... They're giving, they're sowing spiritual things, and then they're reaping carnal things. And a pastor would sow spiritual things, the word of God, he would feed the flock, and then it says right after that, should he not eat? It says, eateth not of the milk of the flock. Saying, you know, doesn't that make sense? If he feeds the flock, wouldn't it make sense that he would eat of the flock? And it says, verse 8, so say I these things as a man. So that statement right there is saying, do you think I'm just saying this because I'm a man just because I want to be paid? That's his point. Say I these things as a man from just like a worldly perspective, from a carnal perspective, just because I want to be paid. It says, or saith not the, the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of? For oxen. So he makes the statement in the context of speaking about a pastor being paid or an evangelist being paid. He makes the statement that the law says this too. And he quotes a scripture, thou shalt not muzzle the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Obviously the ox is the one that's being portrayed as the evangelist. Or the ox is the one that's being portrayed as the pastor. And he's saying the law teaches the same thing in a picture is what he's explaining. He's using this as a picture to portray this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this is a truth that God would later have quoted by Paul and used to portray this truth. And then he says, doth God take care for oxen? So is the reason why this was penned because he's worried about an oxen? Because he's worried about, you know, you know uh, animals? Verse 10, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. Now look at this verse. This is an exact parallel with what we just read in Romans. It says in verse number 11, If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So he says, if we sow unto you spiritual things, is it a big deal if we reap your carnal things? And this is something that people always try to tag on somebody you know, that's, that's in a ministry. And even a bunch of idiots have tried to say this about me, that the reason why I wanted to go to Valiant, or the, the original Valiant, this is a better Valiant Baptist here, but the reason why I wanted to start, you know, Valiant Baptist Church, and the reason why I kept things hidden and why I didn't say anything and didn't talk about certain doctrines was, was for the reason that I didn't want, I wanted to make sure that I retained all those people so that I could be paid. So that I could make sure that I receive. People always try to like pin stuff like that on someone. They always try to act like, oh, he's just doing it for the money. What basis do they have for that? Any at all? None. 
bunch of stinking liars. And they'll say, oh, he just won. He kept it on the down low, you know, what he believed, just so that he could go and just have this church so that he doesn't even, you know, so that he could just, right from the beginning, he could just start working for the church. I don't know if everybody knows this, the, you know, the, the, the details of this, so I will just make this public to you and to YouTube. But that is a total and absolute lie. Stephen Anderson his, himself is the one that told me, hey, you should work full time from the church from the beginning. My plan was to start a company. Who in here knows about that? I was going to start a telecommunications company when I got here. And Stephen Anderson said, no, you should start full time from the church. And then you got all these retards that attend Steadfast Jackson. They're dumb for just attending that church in the first place. Amen. But then they're a bunch of liars. And they're like, yeah, he just wanted to make sure that he, he just had a cow that he could milk right at the very beginning. So he didn't want to get rid of all those people. You're a stinking liar and a railer just like the rest of these people and you're making crap up. And you know what? You know who's the, the, the biggest sin in that situation? is Steven Anderson because he doesn't step up and say, hey, I was the one that actually told him to work full time from the church. Because I wasn't going to do that. I was actually going to start a company immediately when I got here. Right from the very beginning. But guess what? There's nothing wrong if I get paid from the church. Right. And there is, and I will for sure be going full-time for the church sometime. And the reason why that appealed to me, starting full-time for the church in the very beginning, was because even if I, they weren't able to support me fully financially, I was just going to like do part-time work so that I could invest a lot of time in the beginning so that I could go full-time faster so the church could grow because that's my main goal. I didn't move to Jacksonville to work for some other networking company. I didn't move to Jacksonville to get a job as a telecommunications company, you know, technician somewhere. My goal is to change Jacksonville spiritually, not carnally. My God, you know, I'm not worried about everybody's networking system, you know, make, making sure it's, pro it's functioning properly. That's not my main goal in Jacksonville. My main goal is to affect this, this city spiritually. Amen. And this is something that people will try to just, they'll try to just like, uh, you, know, you know, cloud your character. Well, you're just worried about the money. You're a liar. Show, you know, show some statement that I've made. Show, you know, people just will make up any kind of lie about people. They really will. But this is something that people will attack constantly about. It doesn't matter, you know, whether or not you work full-time for a church, you're thinking about working full-time for a church. This is a common, if anything is related to someone getting money from the church, you'll often see people attacked for it in whatever way they can. Oh, he's just, he's just doing that just so that he can get paid. Or he just lied about that just so he can get paid. Or, oh, he just didn't say that because he, so he could get paid. Or, oh, you know, that guy's just wanting to get money from the church, you know? Number one, it's biblical. And number two, that's a lie. Because they always will try to use that. For some reason, our society looks down upon pastors being paid. That's not, that's not a biblical attitude. Pastors should be paid. Amen. Pastors should be paid. Evangelists should be paid. Paul teaches that if we sow spiritual things, we should reap carnal things. Amen. That's what should happen. That's that you know, and there's nothing wrong. You, what do you think that you know that pastors? What this is? It's still work. I mean, I don't know what people think about like working for a church and stuff like that. Like that's not work. It's, you're, you're still doing things. You know, you're using your legs. You're using. You're working. You know, you're doing all different types of tasks and duties. You're studying the Bible. There's all different types of things that are done. You know, the remodeling of this. Of this church, there's tons of things that are done. Tons of work that goes into being a pastor. Scheduling, organizing, all different types of things, depending upon what job that you have. And it's crazy that, that you would expect anyone that does work just to not be paid. It's like, if you did it, I guarantee you'd want to get paid. But the Bible clearly teaches. It doesn't matter your opinion. You can logic whatever you want out. He clearly teaches... If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Go back to Romans chapter number 15. Now that I got that off my chest. Romans chapter number 15. Look at, um, we're there in verse number 27. We'll read, we'll read the end again there. So it says, For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also, their, notice that. He says their duty. I didn't even notice that the first time I read it. He says, if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. You notice what that's saying? If somebody does something for you spiritually, like a church helps you or a pastor helps you, it says your duty. Your, you know what duty is? It's your job. It's what you're obligated to do. 
like a tithe. You know, your duty is to pay to the church. That's what your duty would, that's what your job is to do. And people will teach like that tithing is not biblical. I've preached, I'm not going to go into that right now. I've preached a full sermon on it. Tithing is still biblical in the New Testament. Amen. The Bible teach, teaches, excuse me, tithing. And it says that if, if you're receiving spiritual things, your duty, that means your job, is to pay carnal things. You know, to give carnal things, which is referring to money, to minister unto them in carnal things. So they're helping out another church. In this case, look at verse number 28. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit. So he's saying once I, you know, when he says sealed there, he's saying finished. Like when something's sealed, it's totally done. And the fruit there, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. And I'll explain this further. The fruit there is referring to the fact that it's, it's like a seed sown. I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 9. No, 2 Corinthians 9, sorry. 2 Corinthians 9. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. This is also talking about giving. And it's talking about giving from one church to another. It's not talking about giving to your local church. You know, uh, if you read the, entire, the entirety of the passage, uh, look at 2 Corinthians 9 verse 4. Lest happily if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort, exhort the brethren, that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be written, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. But this I say, it, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. So he's saying, as far as blessings, if you give a little bit, you're only going to receive a little bit back. And then he says, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Saying God will pay you back bountifully. God is a just God. Whatever you give, he will give you back according to what you gave. Verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly. So don't give with the attitude of not wanting to give when you're helping someone. Give, he says, cheerfully. Look what it says. Or He says, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So when you're going to you know, give charity to another church or you're going to give something extra other than your tithe, don't do it grudgingly like, oh, man, I could use this money for other stuff, man. No, you should give the money. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. Don't do it. If you're going to do it, don't do it grudgingly. That's what this is teaching. If you're going to do it, don't do it of necessity like, ah, oh, I, I saw him you know, give 20 bucks, so I have to give $20. You know, that's not the right attitude either. Right. To do it of necessity, you should do it cheerfully. You should like to do it. Be a cheerful giver, he says. Now look at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. He's saying, if you give, God's able to make grace abound toward you. That he's going to pay you back toward you. That ye all, always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now notice what they receive back. Is it carnal things? No. It says that they abound in every good work, saying that they're going to receive back in spiritual things. And anyway, God, it's, it's, obviously it's hard for us to understand this, but God, can, he can measure, you know, lay things in the balance, and he knows the equivalency of something spiritual and something carnal. You understand what I'm saying? So if you give something carnal a certain amount of money, God knows what he's going to pay you back spiritually. You know what I mean? Obviously, we would have no idea. You know what I mean? But he can understand things like that. Well, this is sufficient for what he's given. Because notice, that's, that's exactly what he started teaching right before he went into this. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. You know, if you give bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. And that's speaking spiritually in this sense. Now, keep reading. I'll show you that further. He says in verse 9, As it is written, he hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remaineth forever. Now, watch what it says right here in verse 10. Now, he that ministereth seed to the sower. So, the person that ministers seed to the sower. So, if Brother Russell is the sower. I have the seed. I'm giving to him the seed, right? He's the sower. It says, both minister bread for your food. And then it says, and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So notice the fruit, the ultimate out outcome of the bread that comes back to me is considered the fruit. And in what context are we speaking of this? He's talking about giving, right? He's talking about, you know, uh, if you will, giving charity. Like a, they'll talk about a love offering or a charity offering that you would give to a, you know, to an evangelist or something that would travel around. 
Because that's not your tithe. That's not going to your local church. That, that's not your 10%. That's extra money that you would give. And if you're going to support somebody like that, a missionary or something, you shouldn't give it grudgingly. You should be a cheerful giver. And the things that you give to that person, right? You're giving it to the sower, who would be the missionary, if you will. He goes and he sows the seed, right? So you have to pay people that go overseas and preach the gospel, obviously. You know, obviously they could get a job while they're there and go that route. But it would be better if they could just work full time. And then they, then they wouldn't have to work during the day. Then they could just dedicate every ounce of their energy to preaching the gospel. And that would be wonderful, like many people in the Bible do. So if you paid someone, right, who is the sower of the seed, and what, what does the seed represent in the Bible? The Word of God. So you're paying a missionary. He's going out and he's preaching the Word of God. When he's sowing the seed, right? You're giving money to him, carnal things, and then he's taking that and using that to preach the Word of God. He's sowing the seed. When souls get saved, and, and, and you know, like it says right there, and increase, notice that, increase the fruits of your righteousness. So if you pay this guy, he goes out and he gets people saved, guess what you're going to get? God is going to give you spiritual blessings. God is going to give you some type of blessings, whatever God decides that that may be in your life. But the, notice that, that is in, it's increasing the fruits of your righteousness, that that is a fruit that's given unto you. Go back to Romans chapter number 15 so we can see what he says right there. When therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit. Now notice he calls it a fruit right there. He's talking about the money that's being given and that fruit is coming from those of Macedonia and Achaia that are paying it unto Jerusalem, right? And if they go out and use that money right, preach the gospel, then that will give fruit unto those in Macedonia and those in Achaia. He says, I will come by you in, into Spain. So after he drops that money off, he says he's going to stop by them into Spain after that. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So he's saying, I, I'm begging you that you would just, you know, I'm striving, just strive with me in your prayers to God. And then he, and he explains what he wants them to pray. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. So we can see here, that he kind of already has a clue that if he goes to Jerusalem of what's going to happen. You know, and even making more sense that he's aware that this is the, the last time that he goes. Because what we read in Acts 24 is actually when he's giving his testimony um, to the guards, after he, to, the, to the king, to the governor. He's giving his testimony to the governor because you had Felix and Festus and the one replaced the other. And he, when he's giving his testimony, he's just explaining when he came. And he's telling you that the reason why he came was to give those contributions to the poor, right? So right here we can see that he actually had a clue that, they, that those that didn't believe that they were after him, and we knew, that, that, we knew that, uh, that Paul was aware of that already. The very first time, we, the first city that he was in, he was let down in a basket because people were trying to kill him uh, down the wall of the city, and he escaped. It says, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted <coughs> Of the saints. So also that he's received of the saints when he goes there. He wants to make sure that his service, you know, that he's bringing that contribution, that they will receive it. Verse number 32, he said, That I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Then he says in verse number 33, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now he ends a lot of his writings that way. If you look over at verse number 24, it's interesting. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So notice there he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Verse number 33 there, he ends verse, uh, chapter 15 saying, now the God of peace be with you all. That's because the God of peace is the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one. Amen. But let me explain to you the structure of Romans chapter, because this is a shorter um, you know, sermon tonight. We're going to wrap up right here just telling you and, and refreshing your mind of the body of how, how the, uh, the layout of the book of Romans, if you will. Romans chapter number one, you know, he has his, his uh, introduction that he goes into. And then you really have the body of the, book of the book written to the Romans all the way to verse number 33 here. This is basically where the letter to the Romans, as far as the content or the meat, the purpose why he's writing to them, ends. That's why you see amen there. And amen is a word that is used... Uh, to signify finality, that something is finished, right? 
It's meant to, you know, it's meant to be used to say that you're done speaking, basically. Now, Romans chapter number 16, the, this Latin next chapter next week, i got to like preach on any statement that I can use because it's the longest chapter, it's the longest list of salutations in the entire Bible. And that's why he says here at the end of Romans chapter 15, Amen. He's done writing to them about the meat of why he you know, wrote to them in the first place, the purpose of why he wrote to them. He's finished with that. And then at this point, he's getting ready to go into just basically telling them goodbye, salutations, right? That's just what it basically means. To salute someone is like saying hello or saying goodbye, right? So he's getting ready to greet all of them and say goodbye, give them good wishes. Sometimes people word it that way. He's going to give them good wishes. And he makes a few last statements. So this right here is pretty much the end of the book of Romans in verse number 33. And then Romans chapter number 16, what we will get into next week, is the list of salutations. Now, it's still important when we get into that, if you find free time, look up some of these names because they're mentioned elsewhere in other books. And you can see that some of these people travel. Some of the people that, made, that he might be writing to that are at the church at Rome, they were somewhere else prior to that. You know, you can see them moving around and being mentioned in other areas and stuff. So that's real interesting if you would look up some of these names. Could be somebody with the same name. Uh, but it's still interesting to study out. Even stuff like that. We should love all of God's work. So you shouldn't be thinking, oh, I'm not coming next week because it's just salutations. <laughs> you should be here and you should love every second of it. You, and even if you don't, try to force yourself. You know, these are words that the Holy Ghost spoke. Right. You know, they're there right. for a reason. Yeah. And you know, and, and you say, well, what's the purpose of this whole chapter, Romans chapter 16 of salutations? Maybe you should memorize everybody's name. Because, you know, when you have a larger church, sometimes people don't do that. He hadn't even been to this church. And he was able to just, hey, greet this person, greet this person, greet this person, greet this person, greet this person. And he said, I've never seen you face to face. But he mentions like 20 people. And then you go to a church with like 200 people that you see three times a week. Not this church, of course. But people do that, and they don't even know half the people's name. You know, so maybe that's an application. I'll hold that for next week. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for all of it. We ask you that you would please uh, just uh, embed, a, embed in us and in our minds uh, just the love of all of your word, dear God. We thank you, dear Lord, for the example of Paul. He was a hard worker, that he was constantly just traveling everywhere, that he had a, a true heart just to preach the gospel to every creature. We ask you, dear Lord God, that you would put that zeal inside of us as well, that you would just uh, instill in us the desire to, to reach all with the gospel and to, uh, to uh, just stand up for your word just like Paul did. Um, even unto death or unto bonds or whatever it may be. We just thank you for the great example of the Apostle Paul. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.